Also, I had a bunch of um, coffee. I'm gonna urinate really quickly. Give me two seconds here. Ugh, I took a shit. Yeah. I ended up taking a shit. You ever do that? You go to you go to take a pee. And you're like, you know what? I can feel. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown. I am Kevin Lieber. With me, as always, is Matthew Tabor. Joining us once again, we're bringing yes. it back. Psychic Pebbles, thanks for being with us, Zach. Thank you for having me back on. You know, uh, the first time we did such a great job, I thought I'd come back and ruin my legacy on this show and uh, uh, do a really horrible podcast and destroy your guys' career. You know, take you guys down with me and just collectively, the three of us can record the worst podcast ever. I think that's a good goal. <laughs> It what would be nice think? to be known as the podcast of downfalls. I would be okay wouldn't, with that. Yeah, wouldn't that be great to have like a down the rabbit hole about yourself and just be like, oh, look at that. I fucking sucked so badly that it's like noted on the on the internet history books <laughs> that you had a big downfall. Yeah, the the abyss unknown. And yet the, the sequel is pretty much always worse. So there's no way that we'll do anything. Yeah, it's pretty rare the that a sequel's right better now. than the original. It happens. Like Terminator 2. Some people say yeah. aliens. It happens. It happens. It exists. If James Cameron is the director, it happens. <laughs> Shrek, well, Shrek, Shrek 2. I don't know if he directed that movie or not, but that also I think people gen ge generally think that Shrek 2 is better than Shrek 1. I don't know the inner workings and the sort of uh, all of the ins and outs of why Shrek 2 is better than Shrek 1. I've just – I've heard it. That's, that's the word on the street when I go out and I talk to my boys, you know? Which one has the Smash Mouth song? That's the I think question. all three. I think all seven of them do. Yeah, <laughs> set they're up to seven now. <laughs> yeah, all seven. I think in four, five, he like gets hit on the head or something. It becomes stupid. There's all these different ideas for the movies. They've really branched out, you know. Well, I want to start talking about your health because you know we we love and respect and and care about you. And you know, recently you had mentioned your sleep being all messed up. So how's your sleep? Uh, it's, 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 it's teetering on acceptable and also not great. Uh, yeah, with this whole crazy, uh, pandemic thing, I don't know if anyone's heard about this thing going on, uh, some bug got loose from something. And anyhow, because of that, uh, I can't go to the gym anymore, which is fine. You know, whatever I can, I can deal with that. But really the biggest casualty of all is my sleep schedule got so out of whack and I was going to bed at like 5 a.m. a few weeks ago. It's. I, I think I went to bed at 7 a.m. one day a few weeks ago, and I've sl I've sort of slowly pushed it back. You know, I used to do that thing where you go, I'm going to stay up all night, and then you go to bed the next day at like 8 p.m. I did that, and then I instead of going to bed at 8 p.m., I fucking blew right past it and went to bed at like 3 a.m. <laughs> that second day. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to start pushing it forward earlier. And I, today I got up at like 11.15 specifically for this. So... I think it's a little bit better. Uh, I'd like to push it back to like eight o'clock or seven o'clock, but uh, yeah, it's 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 in shambles. Is the short answer? Are you now? Is your guys? Is your guys like life in shambles? Are you? Are you waking up at a proper hour? Are you exercising? Is your diet good? Are you keeping your body at a healthy level? My diet's fantastic. I've lost twenty five pounds. What, what was since, the last uh, thing you ate? What was the last meal you ate? Twenty five pounds. Yeah, twenty five. Yeah, about six pounds a month, and now it's April. Or no, it's it's May. Oh God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So about pound and a half a week, very healthy pace. Um, I've been eating a lot of vegetables. That's that's yes. been a lot of rutabagas, a lot of root vegetables, which increasingly turn up on episodes of the Create Unknown. I like talking turnips and rutabagas and all sorts of root vegetables. Um, but it's been it's been really healthy. And with sleep, I've been getting a lot of it and waking up at between five and six. Oh, it's gonna, awesome. You son of a bitch. This In guy's the morning. eating healthy. He's, getting up, at, he's yeah. getting up at like Navy SEAL hours, like 3 a.m., yeah, but, but Zach, yeah. the, the reason I wanted to ask you is because this is a thing, right? This is a thing that I think a lot of, at least I hear from a lot of YouTubers and, you know, I, I imagine Twitch streamers as well of having a flipped schedule. And I just wanted your thoughts on that. Like, why is that a thing and why is it so prevalent to be I, up I all don't night and sleep all day? In my opinion, I think I've cracked this or like sort of figured out what the problem is because I've thought about this for a long time. And I think what it is is... I think anybody, you take somebody who's 15 years old or 30 years old or 60 years old, and you say to them, all right, you have no job that you have to go into, 
like from a you know you don't you don't have to punch in punch out, and you work from home. You know, basically that's what a retired person is almost. And obviously, YouTubers <laughs> do work and everything. But will you give anybody, uh, you know, all of the freedom of all right? You have to figure out when you go to sleep, when you eat your food. You know, if you go to a job, if you go to a, a, a regular sort of nine to five, which I, th- I think everybody's worked. There's a convenience in just that you know when you have to be there, you know when you get to eat, it's from like usually what, 11 to 12 or whatever, or 12 to 1. Uh, so you're kind of given all that, and you don't have to really think about that. Um, and, and I think this applies generally to a lot of things that we used to not have to think about at all. I feel like 10,000 years ago, you never had to think about not eating too much junk food, you know what I mean, or sleeping. You didn't really have an option to stay up until 2 a.m., I guess you could, but you'd go to bed when it got cold. And when the sun went down, and you'd wake up when this it got hot, and when the the what you know when the sun came back up. But now you've got to think about what time do I go to bed? What time? What do I eat till I get fat? So I think it's just juggling all of these things. It just becomes a little bit. Um, it, it becomes di- difficult. It becomes like sort of counterintuitive to what how, how we kind of evolved and how most people are used to working and maintaining things. So I I, th- I think it's just the actual act of having to maintain that. When it's 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 usually kind of um, it's a little bit of an afterthought to most people, but I think even regular people now, compared to fifty years ago, have a problem doing it. They just get fired if they if they do sleep in, you know. Boromir and the Baby Gang had a question that we you know we do the questions at the end, but this one is so directly relevant to what you're talking about that uh, that I, I want to prompt you with it. Where uh, Boromir wanted to know what what a day in the life of Pebbles is like during isolation. So, given the sleep stuff, given the weirdness, uh, what's Pebble in here? Oh, good lord! Well, it, I, I I'll say this: no, nothing's been super consistent, but um, generally, the way I've kept myself sane is I just assume that I'm on a spaceship and I'm not allowed out of my apartment. You know what I mean? Because I feel like <laughs> you go crazy if you're if you're every day you're checking the news and you're going. Oh, is it today? No, you're not going to get out for a while. Just pretend you're stuck here. So I just sort of accept. And I've left my apartment, obviously, to, to go get groceries and things like that. Um, with the gloves and the masks, obviously, I don't want to get I don't want to get uh, stoned. I don't want to get buried up to my neck in sand and stoned. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah, I I, I try to uh, generally make coffee right when I wake up. I have some black coffee usually. I try to get some exercise in there, even if it's just like running up and down my block, you know, some kind of high intensive, uh, interval cardio where you, where you run back and forth as fast as you can. Uh, you know, there's no treadmill. Uh, so I've been trying to do that. And I've been trying to, you know, not completely deteriorate and wither away and, and, and be, you know, uh, look like a, like a skeleton. So I've tried to keep muscle with pushups and things like that. But outside of that, really nothing but much interesting. I've just been trying to work also and keep myself goal oriented and things like that. Because I feel like also that's the other thing that drives you crazy, right? That's why people that retire, they, they've they been working their whole lives. They kind of get lost and they start to – like their brains become like mashed potatoes after a year <laughs> because they have no goals. Yeah. So I think goal-oriented <laughs> is the best thing you can do. Just have a goal. Even if you don't believe in the goal, just say, I'm going to get a six-pack. It's stupid. That's a ridiculously stupid goal and you'll never get a six-pack and you'll always be fat and you're going to die fat and stupid. But if you have that as a goal in your head, you know, today you've got something to climb towards. So that keeps you up in the morning. So uh, yeah, I've just been trying to give myself goals that I can that I can crawl towards in this horrible uh, uh, pandemic uh, nightmare. What about you guys? Are you you know I, how, what what is your schedule like? Do you have a semblance of a schedule at all? Well, you know, Matt's been waking up at the the crack of dawn, like, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, like a seventy yeah. year old man trying to <laughs> not have his brain turn into mash mashed potatoes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I usually start you know a little later, like eight thirty. But um, I have a lot going on and a lot of things to juggle and a lot of people to talk to in regards to like the curiosity box and all of that stuff, Vsauce stuff, and then this podcast. So yeah, there's there's always kind of like different e- people to email back every day. There's so I know, much dude. of that and checking in with yeah. how's this thing coming along. And I know it sounds so boring to uh, even listen to anybody talk about their emails, but um, it's reality, though. That is reality. Yeah, it's like well, the great, the great reality is, if, is the great reality is if you put the emails off for like a day or two, and then you respond to like five emails or ten emails or whatever the fuck it is in one day, 
then those teddy bears respond back, and then it's like you got to do it all over again. It's a never ending. Do you have that where it's like, all right, you put it off for one day, and then you, you feel good about yourself because you knocked out like fifteen emails in a day, and then all fifteen emails respond with something else. And it's like it's <laughs> never ending. It's like a bucket of water outside of a sinking ship. You know, the only winning move is is not to play. Yeah, yeah, to quit all of this to go 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 be a painter in the middle of Illinois and delete all of your social media. That's that's the only way to win. Go start a painting business in the middle of Illinois and raise, f- impregnate some beautiful 26-year-old and have 15 children with her. It's the only way to really be happy in this fucking horrible world we live in. Wait, <laughs> hi, 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 Easter eggs around your, your, your fucking $30,000 house as a 10-bedroom because you're in Illinois. Uh, why, uh... Why is Illinois to you like the most desolate I don't, place? Just the, Iowa, Earth. anywhere, Colorado, <laughs> anywhere in the middle of the country, flyover country. Go there and buy again, buy a thirty thousand dollars house, and, but it's 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 a fifteen bedroom, and you got fifteen kids, and you have Easter egg hunts, and they go, Daddy, Daddy, I think. they run and they pick one up, and you go, ah, you tussle their hair, and you're not thinking about emails or fucking <laughs> subscribers or or Keemstar or Pro Jared. You're just looking at the <laughs> the, the happiness in your son's eye, the genuine love. A so family. this is this is your escape plan. You've thought about this. Yeah. This is oh, I'm out of here, dude. I'm I'm out of here. Are you kidding me? This sucks. <laughs> you gonna raise children? Are you nuts? <laughs> so, I, I, I don't like waking up at reason- fucking four p.m. <laughs> One of the reasons I wake up at five in the morning is because the neighbor has a bull that the, this this bull bleats really loudly. I, I don't know if it's called bleeding when it's a, a male. Um, a bull? Like, what do you mean? Ah. Like, like a? You mean a bull? Yeah, yeah, like male cow bull, uh, and that kind of wakes me up. And so I've got like half of what you just described. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't have any of the kids, but I, I feel like now I should I should go talk to talk to Mora and be like look we should we should have kids and it's not because i want kids i just need to it's stop not, it's not it's not because i like you i just want the kids yeah i just want the or yeah exactly yeah but it's wait, pro wait, wait. jared all the time in my head i can't Matt, stop you and there's have only it. one solution to this <laughs> you, you you already do this with the Easter. Uh, Zach's making fun of the the Easter baskets and the and the Easter eggs. You I, not, I love that. I, I, <laughs> genu- do I genuinely love the Easter. I want that in my life. No, he forces oh, he forces his uh, his lady friend to give him an Easter basket. He gets up at five a.m. He's eating vegetables yeah. and, 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 and turkey and whatever else, and he's got a bowl next door, and he has Easter egg hunts. Yes, I want this guy's life. Let's do a body swap. Let's switch. Let's trade. It must be 20 years where I've, I've, you know, woken up on Easter morning to, uh, yeah, really nice Easter basket. I've never had one of the hunts for eggs. Um, but, but yeah, I got, uh, I like black jelly beans a lot. And so like, I, I usually get a bag of the licorice jelly beans and, and, uh, some mini eggs and stuff like that. Now, do you get those took, big yeah. ridiculous chocolate rabbits that you bite into the fucking ear that's hollow? Do you get those things every year? I used to, I used to, when I was a kid, I did, especially, you know, the, uh, Palmer is a company that makes those hollow rabbits too. And I, I came to resent Palmer as, as a company for, Oh, you think it's a scam because they, the inside's hollow and it's not full of chocolate. Yeah. I did see one at CVS yesterday that was on clearance because it's past Easter and it was hollow, but it was huge. Like this rabbit was easily two feet and i think the weight was like two and a half pounds so that as far as hollow chocolate rabbits go was really cool but all the little ones are just awful <laughs> this is what adulthood is it's talking about the, the size and the girth and the weight of a chocolate rabbit at cvs <laughs> for all you kids out there this is adulthood right here easter egg hunts and wake up at 5 a.m and the, the absolute size the incredible size of a hollow easter bunny at CVS. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we have left yeah, it's all downhill from here. I think we need goals. That's the problem. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. Goals. See, if I if my goal was to eat that whole chocolate rabbit, I would have I would have been. If I had seen that rabbit, I probably would have been bummed out because I would have thought I'd never buy that rabbit. Someone's gonna buy that rabbit. I'm not gonna. I, what do you, what? No, seriously, who do you think does buy those two those giant gigantic two two pound <laughs> rabbits? Who's buying that? Um, I think you could give them to a gaggle of children and just say like, "Hey, you four kids, why don't you split this big rabbit?" But, just let it, just let them take it apart like a zombie movie. Just let them have to destroy yeah, it. It's like, <laughs> it's like Night of the Living Dead three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a leash on it. It's intestines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we 
at some so point back to pro t- jared please <laughs> okay fine yeah, yeah. we'll just go back to that then what's there is there something new there i don't think so no just sailor moon no. costumes i think yeah just the cool sailor moon shit yeah <laughs> we've we've always we've all always admired that, so that's not even news. <laughs> that's also the other part of adulthood everyone has to look forward to. Yeah, adulthood is looking at pro Jared news on Twitter when it's trending, and then uh, giant chocolate rabbits at CVS. <laughs> that's adulthood. Those, those are the two the, <laughs> the two most defining things of adulthood. Anybody can tell you. the The third most defining thing is actually um, fulfilling your dreams, and. Uh, <laughs> Recently, you had Smiling Friends come out. It dropped pretty surprisingly on the world, on the internet world, and it is amazing. And so congrats, first of all, on that. Second of all, I love it. Third of all, I've watched it a couple of times, and um, I'm I'm ready to grill you with, with all of my Smiling Friends questions. Uh, grill me up. First of all, thank you. But yeah, I'm, I'm second of all, grill me up. I'm ready to, I'm ready to be grilled on the spot. Off the off the hip, folks. None of this is written. None of this is pre-recorded. Well, this is pre- the whole thing is pre-recorded, but none of this is written down. <laughs> it's all improvised, all off the hip. the The first thing I want to ask you about is the defining thing that I couldn't stop thinking about for probably the first four days after first watching the pilot, and that is the guy <laughs> living in the wall. <laughs> because I I I first just need to know whose idea was that. Where did it come from? And just to let you know how I couldn't stop thinking about the guy living in the office wall. Well, first of all, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's funny is we, we almost cut that guy, actually. We all we, had, we almost did it because when we wrote the original script, it was like when we wrote and recorded. In fact, the ending was actually different. There's a couple different things. And the wall guy was one of those scenes that just it, – it's it was really funny, but it, it was like one of the longest scenes in the whole thing. It's like a minute long or something. Just that one conversation. And so we, we got to some point where we were near the end when we were kind of in the editing bay deciding what to cut and what to keep. And luckily we kept it. But I think that was an idea that, that – I think it was just something Michael and I both pitched. And I, the whole – to us from the get-go, kind of the, the original fun of the show to us was – these crazy, colorful, weird-looking characters, almost like aliens, they're just weird-looking. You can't really say that they look like this or like that because, you know, they're just... They have no ears or nose, but they're not animals and they're not insects. They're just these weird things. But, as crazy as they look, um, they're real. Like, the, and, and I think if I could explain the show to anybody and try to pitch it to what... At least what, to us, makes it work... And you really didn't even get a lot of this in the pilot, which is why we're so excited if we get to make more. There's a lot of the world we really want to look at, a lot of the characters. But just that joke of these these blue and green characters sitting there, but they're breathing and they're just – their chests are kind of – they're just real. That's the joke. Like they blink and they have heart problems and they have fucking – they have ADD <laughs> and they're just – they're like these characters don't hit a wall and they flatten out. They're like – they have real – if you hit a character in the head with a hammer, they would have like a seizure. And so that was the joke to us, just like also, also animating the characters breathing and their eyes moving around and them kind of tapping. And part of that whole world to us also was just kind of realistic arguments and, and kind of talking how people talk. And again, you don't get a whole lot of that kind of dialogue in the pilot because it moves really quick, I feel like. There's a lot kind of packed in there. Um, so you, that, that and I think maybe at the beginning when he's showing him the alien – are really kind of the only two moments like and maybe the boss when he comes back to the computer but there's not a whole bunch of those moments where it's really kind of trying to sound like two guys talking um and so our inspiration was just to kind of put that energy that that kind of dna into the pilot somewhere uh and if we get to make more we have a lot of those moments planned where i don't feel feel like it ever takes over the show but it always kind of stops the show for a second to to have those moments and i feel like Again, you'll see more of that, hopefully, if we get to make more of those weird kind of just really hyper real moments between characters where the joke is kind of like there's no joke. They're just they're just talking and they're just uh, really arguing and they're really pissed off at each other. There is a the it's I'm so glad that you said that because I noticed that in uh, towards the beginning and I, I rewatched it this morning, but I can't remember what the conversation was. All I remember was I thought it was funny that your your I believe it was your character, Charlie, just ended a conversation by just going, okay. 
Like, <laughs> <laughs> like that was the end of the conversation. You just go, okay. Yeah, a, lo- is- a lot of it. A lot. A lot of it is just that. Yeah, it was. It was. It was near the beginning when he's trying to show uh, Pim the uh, the thing on the TV. But that's how when Michael and I improvise for the characters. That's pretty much how most of the conversations go. It's like, hey, Charlie, look at this. All right, man. Okay. It's just that. <laughs> is it? But there's something so funny because that's real. Like everybody's had that moment where you're trying to show your friend something on YouTube or on, a, on like there's five or six people around sometimes and you're like you show somebody a cool video and nobody's paying attention <laughs> and you're like, yeah, you can turn that off. I, don't, I wasn't even watching it. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Those little moments of just weird humiliation and awkwardness where nobody acknowledges it. <laughs> those unspoken things are so unbelievably funny to me where it's like, ah, you know, whatever, turn it off. I was, it, it doesn't matter. I was, it's fine. I, I already showed you the part I wanted to show you. It's whatever. <laughs> like that, that, that to me is so fun. I've had that happen so, and everybody's had that happen. Everybody can, has had a moment like that where it's like, all right, well, I guess nobody's listening. Where you're so excited to show somebody and share a moment with somebody else, and they just could care <laughs> less about anything. Yeah, and it's not, it's not even that they're being mean to you. The real comedy is they're, they're not even, they don't even know how much, they weren't even paying attention enough to know that you were super excited about it. So then you try to save face and you go, yeah, what I, oh, it was stupid. I can't remember what it was anyways. It's dumb. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny. It's, it's, I forgot how, it was actually not that funny rewatching it now. So you know, <laughs> just try to save face in any way you can. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, we, we hope we hope we can put a lot more of that in the show in those little moments where it's deserved. I don't think it'll like if you watch a show like Home Movies, which is I I love that show a lot. Mm-hmm. The whole show is that kind of. Mm-hmm. So I think I think if we if I could boil the show down to anything, I think mostly it's it's the characters are crazy looking, but they're alive and they're real. Hopefully, is what you come away with with after watching. But I don't feel like we'll ever kind of get into that the whole show. We're always going to have a spine of a story where you're kind of trying to get from A to B, which is something we really wanted to try to put into, which is the model we love for that is Seinfeld, which is Seinfeld. They never had a serious moment. They never had. I think their motto above their writer's room was no hugging, no learning for Seinfeld. In other <laughs> words, I, I I think I mentioned this last time I was here, but basically the idea of it was George and Kramer and, and Jerry and Elaine are never going to hug and say, I really learned the big lessons, and you know, it was always stupid. It was always meant for laughs, but it always did tie up at the end. It wasn't just like the plot was still there, and it was always really clever. It was always still funny, but the way it tied up was always interesting. And, right, uh, but we, every we tried- single sitcom ended exactly that way, where Psst, yeah, everything starts over. Even though there was a big dramatic change throughout the episode that they had to deal with, where like all of a sudden Urkel's blind or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but by yeah. the end of it, he gets his his eyesight back and ultimately learned like the most valuable lesson about friendship. And exactly hugs. what Seinfeld would do was, all right, let's say George, just for example, let's say George is the one who goes blind, right? At the end of the episode, they would not resolve it because that's funny, but they would still have that somehow tie in to Jerry's story or something. You know what I mean? They always find a really funny way to to resolve something without fixing it because the whole the whole joke of a plot usually is that it's broken. You know what I mean? So they would never fix it and make it unfunny, but they would always use the the wrong thing with the plot to fix another plot. Um, right. It's kind of hard to articulate no, exactly because, what I mean. Because George is blind, he accidentally bumps into something, and then to Jerry's all of a sudden, girlfriend, and she spills right. coffee. Yeah, exactly. It was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was like, oh, oh my, my one thousand dollar jacket that Jerry. But yeah, yes, exactly. They always found a way to make it tight, and that's something I, I, I think Seinfeld and maybe Curb Your Enthusiasm were the two shows that I've seen comedy shows that are really, really good at that. And I think that's just Larry David. Always Sunny does a pretty good job of that sometimes, but. And South Park does too, but I think I think uh, Seinfeld maybe is because the, they have four storylines that they would always wrap up, and it was always unexpected. Um, anyways, I don't want to ramble too much about that, but yeah, I, I that that's something we took a page from. And if I could, if I could see any show that people start to copy more in terms of just how not even the style of writing, but just in terms of what to take away from how to do it, I think Seinfeld is a great blueprint for like how to write a comedy show. Where you still you st- in South Park too, but you're still being you're still being loyal to the plot and you're still resolving the plot, but you're not making it uh, you're not making it serious. You're not undoing the comedy of what the plot is. And how do you deal with that when an episode is twelve minutes? I mean, Smiling Friends was about twelve minutes. Is that right on the runtime? Yeah, it's eleven. Yeah, it's basically twelve. Eleven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the two formats what, are basically. How is that challenging then? It's it's really weird. Uh, 
I feel like Smiling Friends could have been a half hour just because of what how much happens in it, and I feel like we could have taken it at a time. But Michael and I come from kind of the YouTube world where we're used to making two or three or four minute long videos, and the amount of stuff you have to pack in to three or four minutes, it's not even because three or four minutes long is some great time length. It's just because uh, anything above that, it's going to become a little bit impractical to make something like that consistently. So kind of, I think two to four minutes is kind of the sweet spot because that's about all one guy can make. Even if you hire help, really, it's all you can make on a on a consistent basis. But because of that, that, that requires a lot of the stuff you make is really packed in and really dense. And we thought it would be kind of a fun challenge to do 11 minutes. And that would just, we were like, okay, well, best case scenario, it just means hopefully that means we're cutting kind of all the fat and it's just the stuff we really like. And sure enough, at the very end of it, I think our, I think our, uh, I think our script was like 17 pages. Usually the rule is like one page per minute, depending on how fast you go. It could be a little bit above or a little bit below, but I think our script was like 16, it was like 17 pages. It was, it was super high. Uh, and then we recorded it and it was like, it was like about that. It was like 15, I think we, I think we cut some jokes down to be about, it was like 16 minutes. So we had to cut like four minutes worth of stuff. Uh, I think originally the original ending was Charlie gives this big speech about like, oh, you know what? It's like a big heartwarming thing, but it's like, it's, it's a joke, but, uh. I think Char- Alan says, the red character says, I got my cheese back. And instead of him saying, get over here, he says like, oh, you know, you know, I've learned, you know, I've learned that, um, he didn't say I've learned, but he said something, it was, it was basically him going like, you know, you guys are all my friends and I just, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm sometimes mean to you guys, we are, it was just some rambling, stupid long thing. <laughs> and also we had a, we had a weird thing about the boss character. He was doing a song. One of the only things we didn't put into the pilot that I think, we think represented the show was the music aspect and um sick animation mark m the guy who does the voice of the boss he he's really really funny and i would recommend everybody check him out uh sick animation on youtube but he does music and he does albums and he just actually put an album out recently and we really really want to put in if we get to make more we really want to put in um a lot of that a lot of his music and also michael does music so we really wanted to include a musical aspect and because of time, we had to cut out a boss song that originally he was supposed to come in at the end and sing, but it was just, it was way too much. So we had to cut that out. So I guess the short answer is it ended up being exactly what you would think. And and as we, you know, before we even finished the pilot, we started writing kind of spec scripts for what potential other episodes could be. And we kind of have had the same thing going on, which is some stuff ends up being cut and, and being put as, well, maybe we could do that if we do another episode or you know what I mean so but I like that I think it's better that way if it was half hour I feel like we we could do that fine I just like the challenge of it of the 11 minute thing and the last thing I'll say because I'm, I'm talking too much right now is uh is I think one of the good benefits of 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 coming from the internet and of writing too big is that actually if it's if it's if a lot happens like that how we have it and we have a b story too which is kind of rare for 11 minutes to have a b story is I think it makes it a little bit more rewatchable because in that 11 minutes, we packed a lot of stuff in the background too, which I, I don't think everybody's even caught all the background stuff we put in. Like there's some stuff I've seen people tweet at us. I'm like, oh, they, they caught that. But there's a lot of stuff people haven't even seen yet. So I feel like if you watch it, you know, two or three times, you can start looking at the background and you start noticing jokes that you didn't even notice before. So I think that's one of the big benefits. And I, I like doing it that way, even though it's, it's definitely, um, like a headache to have to cut a lot of stuff out. One thing that was really funny to me talking about those background details is when uh, when they bring the guy to dinner to show him the normal family, Pim's family, and it's going poorly. The kid's drawing on the wall in the back, and out of all the things he could be drawing, he's drawing that <laughs> stupid S from the yeah. 90s. Yeah, the Stussy yeah, S, like, as it's called, yeah. What, wait, yeah, sorry, it, what is it called? What is it called? It's called the Stussy S because of the company Stussy, but I think there's been videos debunking that people have done deep dives. I think the shorthand is like the Super S or the Cool S or the Stussy S, S-T-U-S-S-Y. If you Google search it, on, you'll know exactly what it is. It's it's the thing where you draw like the eight li- or the six lines and then you make the S out of it. Right. I remember yeah. doing that. Yeah. Why yeah, is that yeah. a thing? What a weird thing. 
I have no idea, but I'm fascinated a by a lot it. of people did it and nobody knows, but that's, that's exactly the sort of detail that makes it awesome. You know, to catch <laughs> it on, on that second viewing, you see this little thing and then spend, you know, pause it and spend two minutes <laughs> thinking <laughs> of all things. Why is he drawing that? We, I'm glad you noticed that we, we spent, I think after the pilot was done, we were on a big crunch or like the week up coming up to a big done. And we contacted uh, the studio and everybody. We're like, look, can we just have like a couple of days to just go over and add a bunch of stupid shit in the background? Uh, so <laughs> like specifically that dinner scene, you've got a bunch of stuff. Obviously, you've got the kids running in the background. That's not too subtle, obviously. But in that scene, you've also got um, – if you look at the pictures on the wall, we hit a bunch of stuff in the picture frames on the wall. One of the things I've seen nobody's nobody's noticed yet is – uh, when Pim's mom is yelling at Pim's dad, and it's like kind of the shot of her looking at the dad into the other room. There's like a picture frame on the wall of Pim's brother as like an Afghanistan soldier. There's a lot of weird stuff like that that's just <laughs> stupid. That we we went in the last minute, we just put a bunch of Easter egg stuff at the party scene. Um, when they talk to the guy, where he, he hits him away in the background of that scene, there's a guy in a bead bag and he's dead. There's like flies buzzing around him. <laughs> like some guy just died on the bead bag and nobody's noticed because it's a party. So there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in the background that I think, because of the format, because it's 11 minutes, hopefully it's dead stuff where people could go back and watch it, you know, a couple times and notice a lot of the stuff in the background that's 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 specific, specifically built in. We put that in there with the with the purpose of, all right, hopefully people watch it a second or a third time, they'll get a lot of these background details they didn't even realize were there, you know. The the joke that I noticed during that dinner scene was the one kid who's running around the entire time. There's a framed picture of him running on the yeah. wall. So it's like, that's just yeah, the and, running brother, I guess. Yeah, someone took a picture of that, thought it was good enough to put it all. And also, there's a really, there's a quick second at the beginning of Dave Land where that kid is also running through Dave Land. If you look, <laughs> there's, that, there's that kid in the, in the, in the swim trunks running through Dave Land. So he, I guess one of them got loose and he's running around the world, I guess. <laughs> well. Well, I I personally want to thank you for including the breastfeeding scene. Because <laughs> that I was, was... That's what I was just going to mention. I, that's <laughs> what exactly were you going to say I about it? Going. I was going to say that, that <laughs> I wanted to, Zach to know that he has created unknowingly the funniest thing in the world to you, Matthew Tabor. And that's, <laughs> and that's, that's the, that's the, because I bit you video, uh, which you yes. uh, showed yeah. at the Gremlo art show. <laughs> oh yeah. I, would have I was thinking it. about it. This I took, the, I took that video down. People think I took it down because like adults would bought it. I took it down because it was a contest video. And I was like, I, I just hate having mm. contest videos that are like, where you watch it, it's like, the contest ends in March 2013. It's like, uh, it just drives me nuts. I wouldn't mind re-uploading it somewhere, but I took that video down and I was like, you know what, that that was too funny to for it to go to waste. So I, I thought I would repurpose it. And that's the story behind that. That's me being a hack. But um, uh, well, I want to tell you what it's done for me and how it's affected. Yes, yes. How it's affected my life. Yeah, I, like um, I was thinking about it this morning as I was having coffee before the sun was up. It was very nice. It's I'm not getting texts at that hour. Nothing's bothering me. And I really have time to think. And so this is what I thought about. Um, when I when I watched that, I absolutely exploded and I had to pause. I had to pause it. And it was it was 10 to 15 minutes of, of laughing until I was going to throw up. And I was telling Kevin on, on uh, Slack, you know, I'm sending him messages that are like full of typos because I can't even type properly uh, about how sick I'm getting about this. But then I've spent all the time since whenever, uh, whenever the lady asks me something, I respond with, yeah, uh, I, I, if something comes up, you know, just in the kitchen, you know, the best response is, yeah, yeah. do you know why I had to punish you? Yeah. <laughs> um, at one point, she may have said that I was mentally ill and she didn't love me anymore. But I don't care. I don't care. Well, this is I mean, my tough heroin, love. You, and it you, feels you, very good. You did, you did have to punish her. It's tough love. You know what I mean? You can't, <laughs> you know? Wait, I, I want to hear. But, I want to hear Zach. You describe this video for people who haven't seen it exactly, like play the, by the, play. The scene from the what, pilot what, or what the happens? original video that that uh, is now in the abyss. Both. So the original yeah, video, uh, I, I yeah, I was doing I was doing a, an art show contest, and I th I was like I I can't just I can't just put this out there as an art show. It's a little bit 
I just feel weird about it. it logistically and logically, I shouldn't. It, it makes total sense to just put it. So I was like, oh, I'll do a sketch before it. And uh, I was walking around uh, downtown of where I live. And I had that idea. And I was like, that's stupid. I, so I, I ran home and I recorded it. <laughs> And it just consists of this ugly, uh, horrible-looking character that's basically just a version of me, a warped, evil version of me, <laughs> in a big black void, in a huge, gigantic void with a with a drone in the background. And he's sort of holding this thing by the back of the head. Uh, and clearly you're cutting in the middle of a conversation that something's already happened. You're kind of cutting in the middle of the action. And this little baby has a big bruise on its head. And he says – it's just, it's just him saying, like, you know what? I had to punish you. Yeah, because you because you bit me because you were bad, and he goes, yeah, and so it's just a conversation between a lover's quarrel, perhaps, or it could be a father son father son sort of situation. I, I I think the favorite stuff to the favorite stuff to me is to make stuff and to know to, to know there's a story, but to not really know what's going on. Just I, I don't I don't even know what happened. There. Like I really couldn't tell you. I made it. And I don't know exactly what the backstory of that video is. It's kind of up to everyone's interpretation. And I love that he has this big day, you know, do you want, are you It was his big day. Yeah, exactly. What happens? <laughs> he had a big day in the town. He had a big day in the town and something, it's, in my head, in my head, something had a big day in the town and then he got too excited. He got too like uh, amped up and he bit him is, was what I think would happen. <laughs> he was like too jittery and amped up. That's kind of what I think happened. And how'd the bruise on the head happen? I think I don't think it's even as malicious as him punching him or anything. I think he may have just dropped him in fear, and he kind of landed. I mean, again, again, I, I, I couldn't tell you what happened. I don't know. I, I, I saw exactly what you guys saw. I cut it the same. You know what I mean? Like, I have as much information. It's like when you're walking down the sidewalk and you see like a couple fighting, and you're like, "Ooh, I wonder what started that." I always saw halfway in. I don't know. I think he dropped him. I just can't see him like hitting that kid as hard as he could or anything. Look, the, the thing that I want to, to outline here is the, like, you know, you always hear like everybody's creative, right? And it's true. Like human beings have to be creative in order to survive. That's how we developed agriculture. That's how we <laughs> de developed horticulture. You know, whatever. We made this stuff up. We had to be creative. <laughs> how, however, there are varying degrees to creativity. And here yeah. we have you taking a leisurely walk. Just enjoying some fresh air. Yeah, it was a nice and day out too. Of, out of nowhere, this image of a horrible, grotesque goblin version of you <laughs> in a <of> black <laughs> void is breastfeeding an injured, like grossly deformed fetus. Um, and that's it. And that's and it. That's, made, that's all. And then you, you had to make it, and then yeah. You had no, to I make mean, on one side, sure. you've got, you've got the invention of agriculture, you know, the domestication of dogs, you know, uh, the the ability to kind of uh, of, of to kind of uh, harness the power of fire, and then you've got that that video. Yeah, I think it's all kind of on the same plane. If I, I think that's what you're saying, right? They're all kind of on the same plane of of absolute brilliance, is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, the atom bomb of human achievement. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I tell you when what, you got it's, the idea. <laughs> It's a total waste. When you got that idea, did did you stop walking and go home immediately? Or did you I, just think, I'm going to do this when my circuit is done? Because I really I need laughed to know at my own if, joke if like a stopped. fucking idiot and I recorded it on my phone. <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, I, I have, I have, I, I will admit that I, I sometimes, if I'm very lucky uh, and I'm walking around or showering or eating or, or making food, I'll get an idea of a scene. But th this happens a lot. But the thing is, you can't make, you can't really do anything with that. Like YouTube is really the only place where you could. If, 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 let me put it like this: if I could, if I could properly like monetize just like twenty second videos that are like twenty seconds long and just a weird scene between characters, I would have a billion of those. But and I, we try to put those in, in, you know, we try to put those in smiling friends and. and and I try to put those in as much stuff as I can, but I have so many worthless, wasted ideas for scenes that are just that are never <laughs> that are just worthless. Do you find that that happens though? You think something is the funniest? I've had this with with tweets before. Is I think something is so so funny it it, it cracks me up, and I think it's the funniest thing ever. And then two days later, I look at it, and I'm like. That is the dumbest thing ever. Why did I think that was funny in the first place? <laughs> it's it's a mix. Sometimes I'll read something and be like, "That is genuinely the unfunniest thing." Like if I saw that, 
If I saw that idea and I didn't make it, I'd hate it. I if I if I was if I was tethered to that idea, I'd hate it. I get, but the other times, sometimes I do look back and I'm like, that's pretty good. But that's rare. That does not happen that often. Where I'm like, all right, because usually what happens is you write an idea down, and you kind of forget what the inflection is and what the delivery even. Is. A lot of it's delivery based. So if you forget what even made it funny, it's just like words and you're reading it like a book. And you're like, what the fuck is this? This is like white noise. It's nothing. Yeah. Um, I I really want to ask you about the, in my opinion, all-star cast that came together for Smiling Friends. I mean, you have so many people in this that are so, like, I was so excited to see Mark M. from uh, Sick Animation, uh, Mike from Red Letter Media doing a voice, Uh, Chris O'Neill does a bunch of work on the show, and I didn't notice that until I sat and read all the credits because I'm like, I know that there are people that I know hidden in here that I worked on this. So what, what was that process like and, and how exciting is it for you to essentially get to kind of like work with your friends and people you admire? It was great. I mean, look, it really is a dream. And you know what? It's such a Hollywood thing for every project that everybody says we have the we had great people who worked. With. It really is true this time. Like it really, I don't think there's one person you could cut out of the production of the pilot and it would be, like the same. I really believe it. Uh yeah, yeah, Mark M. Sick Animation uh did the boss and uh actually um a guy called David, who if you've ever seen uh Sick Animation's live action stuff where he's got that roommate character that he does, that guy played uh the party guy that, that that's rotoscope that like blows the vape in Pim's face. We got that mm-hmm. guy. He did a great job, he did a really funny job. Uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it was great. Yeah, Chris O'Neill did, did the 3D model at the beginning and he did the, the credits music at the end. Uh, it, it was, it was great. Uh, obviously, finally, uh, Mike Staclasa, Red Letter Media did, uh, did, uh, Desmond, the main character. The whole, the whole kind of mentality we walked into it, uh, oh, and obviously Nick and Finn Wolfhard, but the whole mentality we went into it with was, let's pretend, and I still have this mentality, let's pretend we never get to make any more of this. Let's pretend it's a one-off. And, and I hope this doesn't happen, but let's pretend this is a one-off and the whole project dies with this one thing. That's worst case scenario. And in TV with pilots and everything, it's not unlikely. So we're kind of like, let's go in and out with a bang. That was kind of the idea. Um, one thing I'm proud of is, you know, when The Simpsons gets like a guest in season 32, it's kind of like, you know, it, it'll be like, you know, Lady Gaga comes in as Lady Gaga, and it's just, it's not that great. But I think the best show to ever do uh, voice cameos uh, was South Park, where they had, like, George Clooney come on as a dog, as St- Stan's gay dog in season one, where they literally got, like, one of the biggest actors ever in Hollywood to come bark. Nobody knew it was him. He just barked like a dog. That was it. And there's a famous story of, of Jerry Seinfeld's agent called the South Park guys and said, can you do a voice? And they were like, yeah, you can do a turkey and the agent was like, no fucking way. So we did do exactly that. But I think my, my point is, I think the, the, a really good voice on a good guest voice on an animated show is one you don't even know is a guest voice. And I feel like if you don't know what Red Letter Media is, I hope, I feel like you can watch the pilot and still like enjoy that character. I feel like it works well enough where if you have no idea who Mike Seclassa or Red Letter Media um, or, or even Nick or Finn Wolfhard or Sick Animation... I don't feel like there's anybody that really stands out in a way that's obvious. I'm biased, obviously, because, you know, I wrote it and everything with, with Michael. But I feel like we tried to put everybody in a role that if you had no idea who they were, you would still enjoy it and it would still feel right. Uh, and I feel like if we do get to make any more, that's kind of our model going forward, which would be, all right, we will have some people that are maybe kind of more traditional celebrities, you know, like a, like a, like a Finn Wolfhard, I guess. But I think for him, most people don't even know it's him. They have no idea it's even him. So, but then on the other hand, we have people like Tom Fulp and maybe even kind of sick animation, which is a little bit more kind of an indie online internet person. Um, you know, and we, we have a laundry list of people we'd love to have on. Um, if people, if anybody follows my work or Michael's work and kind of knows what we're interested by, in terms of people we watch, both from a standpoint of like fascination but also admiration, I think you get a kind of a good idea of who we might have as guests. It'll never be like, you know, Tom Cruise comes on the show as Tom Cruise. It'll always sort of be um, 
like, either weird forgotten celebrities or kind of obscure ones. I'd even love to have people who've got to, have gotten into scandals that have kind of been forgotten about. That's, like, interesting to me. It's, like, weird. Ooh, like, like who? Who comes to mind? I don't want to say it because I don't want to spoil it, but, <laughs> but, 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 I mean, not, not, no too big of scandals. I'm just saying, like, um, like, God, who's a good example of, of a celebrity which is not really, somebody who's sort of fallen to the, okay, I'll actually give you a really good one because he's dead now, so it doesn't matter, but Kirk Douglas, we really wanted to, we were like, man, if we get to make any more episodes, Kirk Douglas was born in, I think 19 fucking 16 or something. He was still alive. Yeah, the teens. And we were like, yeah. fuck, how good would it be to have Kirk Douglas come in at 103? Nobody's trying to get Kirk Douglas. Nobody. So stuff like that, where it's like, we, where people that you would never expect, I guess is the best example. Um, so hopefully if we do have guest voices and guest appearances, it would be people either that like you would never expect, or if you did expect it, they would be in a role that you would, you would, you would not even know it's them, hopefully. You know what I mean? Where it feels pretty in the fabric of the show, where it's not standing out as kind of a sore thumb. Can can we get Canadian singer-songwriter Gordon Lightfoot on Smiling Friends? I have no idea who that is, but because of that, I I, 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 that, I don't know who the fuck that is, but that's the kind of person we'd have on because of that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Well, what you described, I was thinking about old music as you're talking about, Kevin is talking about the the all-star kind of lineup on this, and you're <laughs> talking about uh, how you wanted it so everybody or could listen and appreciate and enjoy, even if they didn't know who those yeah. people were. And I'm like, hey, they've put together the Smiling Wilburys, uh, where it's uh, all of these well-known people, but their music together on their own, uh, it stands on its own. That's that's perfect. I, yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Where I want people that have no idea even who I am. I want people that have no idea who Mark M is, because that was sort of it was sort of built in, on two ways, right? So one way, in one way, we 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 knew people were going to get really excited about, you know, again about seeing Mark M and Mike Staclasa and and all these people, uh, put into this thing. But we were also hoping, okay, this thing needs to work a hundred percent on its own. Even if you have no idea who any of us are, that includes Michael and I. Like we wanted it to be so if you turn your TV on or left your TV on and you've never heard of any of us, but you leave that on and you see that show, that it still works. And you're not going, oh, I'm like, you never want the audience to feel like they're missing an inside joke. That's the worst feeling. So uh, hopefully, I, I think it works pretty well on both levels, but um I, I can only have be... you gotten feedback from people who have no idea who any of any of these? Yeah, yeah, we have. We, yeah, we have. I, I've seen comments of people saying, "I don't get who these e celebs are," but I, I, I enjoyed it. So when you see stuff like that, it's a little bit more encouraging. <laughs> and also, we've I've seen people say uh, one of my favorite tweets of all was somebody said, um, "My girlfriend really enjoyed Smiling Friends, but she's too ashamed and she doesn't want anybody to know." So we hope. Our <laughs> goal also is that hopefully even people that. Like, we'd go into it trying to hate it with, like, it. that's kind of, well, that's hopefully our goal, is that people would go into it going, what is this shit? And they would hopefully come out of it with a <laughs> laugh or two, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that you, that the, the, there's probably 70% of people watching Adult Swim go into a new show <laughs> it, with that thought exactly in their yeah, mind. Yeah, people walking into it hoping to hate it. I, like, you can never get everybody. We, that's ridiculous. Like you know, we, you you roll with the punches of people. Even they, there's that one show on the planet that's got 100 percent positive feedback. So we we tried to build it to be as entertaining as possible to people who've never heard of us and to people who are you know our biggest fans. I have a a very specific animation question that I yes. hope that you can answer, and that yes. has to do with the the end of the episode. You have this disgusting, grotesque gross pin painting that dan peacock made for you um that style did red and stimpy invent that i know that spongebob did it later but did anyone do that before red and stimpy where all of a sudden you have this this heinous like hyper realistic like pimples and follicles and nastiness still frame for some every render here in an animation you know, it's funny. I actually never grew up on Red Stimpy. I I pulled that from like SpongeBob. Like I I I were really big into SpongeBob, and I think other shows. I think Fairly Odd Parents even did that a few times. Uh, it just became, but it became a thing that stuck with me. And it's actually, I think it's been so long since any show has really done that. I haven't seen that done in anything since like Flapjack. Really, I guess SpongeBob might still do it, but 
it's been so long. I was like, you know what? It'd be fun to have those moments whenever we feel like it. Our policy for the show also was in the pilot, like, let's try to put in every medium possible. Let's try to put in live action and 3D and uh, stop motion. Whatever we can fit in the pilot, we really tried to do it. And the kind of logic is, let's say we do best case scenario, we do get to sh- do the show for, let's say, not even a crazy amount of time. Let's say we get to do the show best case scenario for like a couple of years, three years or something. We tried to set it up. We tried to make it so the first episode really gave us complete runway to do whatever we wanted to do. So in season three, if we want to do an episode where we have a joke where one of the characters is painted, why not? Like, I feel like we set it up in a way where we could kind of throw anything at the audience and they'll just kind of swallow it because the pilot's so packed with that stuff. Is so, that why the party bro was rotoscoped? Because I yeah, noticed that, that, yeah. stand, that stood out so much. It reminded me of Apollo Gauntlet. Did you ever watch that show? No, but I'm aware – I was aware of that guy's work because people commented that. I think for us, the, just rotoscoping is so funny. I think it's – Mark M actually does really good rotoscoping too in his stuff. It's really funny. Rotoscoping will always be funny, especially if it's a little bit kind of janky looking. But <laughs> some of – yeah, most of it was – like the party thing, the party bro scene was supposed to make it look a little bit more realistic, like that whole interaction. But also, mainly that was just so we could kind of reverse engineer the pilot in a way that allowed us to do whatever we wanted to do, and and so nothing seemed weird. Like if Family Guy did that, it'd be kind of weird. It'd be, it'd, I guess it could be funny, but it'd be really out of character and weird, especially if they started doing stuff like that. So we just tried to make it as broad as possible for ourselves, but we also made sure that again, like the voice acting thing. Wherever we did a joke like that where it broke, we tried to make it so it didn't feel contrived and out of place. You know what I mean? Yeah. And real quick, I wanted to ask you a while ago, and I forgot, what is the elevator pitch of Smiling Friends? Like, how do you walk in to William Street or whatever <laughs> and and say, hey, guys, I got a show, and here's the log line? Like, what is that for this show? We I, – I remember exactly when we kind of figured out the log line because really early in the show's development – Michael and I were trying to figure out – we actually had the name first. We had the name Smiling Friends first, and we were like – we kind of had a rough idea, and I think it cleared some shitty chicken restaurant in Burbank, and uh, we it, we were like, oh, wait a minute. It's like a suicide hotline, but it's like a depression hotline, and they have to help anybody. They've got to help anybody that wants to help. And so actually, one of the funniest – or one of the more interesting comments we kept getting, like on the videos and everything, the the biggest criticism I saw, and it wasn't even that big, but the most consistent criticism I saw was people saying, all right, I like the pilot, but how do you make this a full series? And if we get to make a full series, I'm really excited because to us, like the the idea for the pilot actually came like way into the production of us building this world and building all these ideas and building a pitch deck. So when we pitched the show, we had a bunch of episode ideas, and the episode of the guy who's depressed was us going, wait a minute, if it's a show about a depression hotline, basically, and you've got all these weird stories, the first episode really should be the most obvious one, which is a guy wants to kill himself, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's either like the first episode or the last episode because of how obvious it is. So we sort of reverse engineered the pilot in that way, too. It was like, let's get the most obvious job out of the way. So everything after this, if we get to make more, is really, uh, I think, going to surprise people in a, in, a, in a good way with – it stays on the premise, but the premise gets pretty stretched in terms of what the characters asking them uh, to make them smile, what they're asking uh, for help, like what the reason is basically. Um, so yeah, bas- the elevator pitch was basically a depression hotline. It's, it's like a suicide hotline, except they have to go out every single time in person – and physically, like, do the call. Will the smiling friends ever save a grown man who doesn't get an Easter basket? You'll, well, <laughs> are they capable of that? You'll you'll have to tune in and see, won't you? That's a that's a question for Adult Swim, isn't it? <laughs> Will there's a there's a question that that popped up from a, a conversation I was having with a YouTuber. He, his channel is called Many Kudos, and he does um, comedy videos. His latest one was about uh, bad subreddits, banned subreddits. Uh, but he was, I, I've known him since he was had a few hundred subscribers, and now he's you know near 10,000, and it's, it's looking good. And he was saying that you and the Sleepy Cabin crew were the people who inspired him to start making content on his own. And 
he he was talking about it. He said that he was proud of the success of this pilot. And that was something I saw in all the tweets around the show and the tweets of people tagging you is how it's how like the ownership that the audience took over your success. And that was really amazing to see. I don't, I don't see that very often. Um, but he was continuing to talk and said, uh, uh, you know, like what's, what's the five year plan, uh, for pebbles? Because, uh, you know, you talked about that stuff on, on sleepy cabin and now what's the, what's the 2025 prospectus? My real goal, and I mean, this is with all sincerity really is to just, to just make what I want to make with as most freedom as possible, because there's always a trade-off. If somebody's giving you money, you're not going to have 100% freedom. And if you have the money at all, you have 100% freedom, but you have no money and it takes longer. So, uh, even if this pilot, even if Smiling Friends does not go anywhere, you know, fingers crossed, obviously, but, I'm going to keep trying to do what I'm doing. And I think that's the biggest lesson here, especially with TV. It really is not a matter of who's got the best idea. It's who is persistent. And if you can keep kind of your fighting spirit, if you can keep your, your, if you don't get burned out and you can keep persist, you know, your persistence up, I think that's a winning concoction. But five years from now, my real ideal would be to see not just me. And I mean this really, not just me, but a lot of other really talented YouTube people, Newgrounds people, everywhere, any site you can think of that are doing shows. And I think this will be what, what the case is, by the way. I think doing TV shows and film and music, you're already seeing with, uh, with Joji, you know, Filthy Frank BK, he's a successful musician. I think even if I fail, the good news is even if I completely fail, if I die tomorrow, there will be people that come and will be continuing to come to migrate from YouTube, from the internet, to traditional media, and they're all going to kill. Now, I don't mean that for every YouTuber who ever does anything on TV, because that's happened before. I'm just saying a very specific brand of people who are really, really good at what they do. And I think we could all name people like that where it's like, oh yeah, obviously this person should have a show, or obviously this person should be making film, or obviously this person is great at music, you know what I mean? In a couple of, I think by the end of this decade, it will be sort of like those old pictures of like the Conan writer's room or the Dana Carvey show writer's room where it's like, oh, wait a minute. There's like 15 guys that are all independently successful now. And I think by the end of this decade, it's going to become obvious. Of course, of course, people from YouTube, you know, this guy, this guy, that, that you know, you look at somebody that's making short films and they can write and direct and they're actors and they're good at ADR and they make their own music. Those are going to be the people that by the end of the decade are the ones that are, are the Hollywood's darlings because they're going to be doing the job that takes other people 10, you know, 10, a crew of 10. And so my real goal, really, my, my real plan is keep doing what I'm doing. I'd love to keep making TV. I'd love to broaden out and go a lot bigger than that. Uh, only time will tell. But I will be happy in the same way that you're saying people feel kind of a secondhand accomplishment and a secondhand pride that, that Smiling Friends became a pilot. I feel like I will feel the exact same secondary pride and secondhand pride if I see the trend continue of people who really deserve TV shows getting on TV and people who really deserve film to be going into film, you know, and that whole thing. If 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 I can see that, that's all I'd be I'll be satisfied with. I'd like to keep making what I'm doing. I'd like to keep I'd like to go into film. I'd like to go into things myself, but if I can see that as a whole that's happening. I will be satisfied with that. I think that's a that's a net positive for the world. I think that would change the entertainment world for the better. It would mean less people. It would mean more oversight. Uh, it it would just mean a lot of good things overall. I think. I'm glad you brought up that goodwill thing because I noticed that as well, but I hadn't, I guess, articulated it in my own brain that way. But it's I feel that way about Smiley Friends, like. Honestly, like 100% genuinely, I'm so excited for you and I'm, I'm excited for Michael. I was so excited for Michael when the Rick and Morty thing yeah. came out last year, uh, Bush World. <laughs> that was like the weirdest thing ever because all of a sudden it's like, wait, he, he got to do – he did what? <laughs> like made this nonsensical Australian version of the most popular <laughs> cartoon in the world and like Adult Swim – funded it like how is that possible and how do we get more things to happen like this because it's great and i do wonder about 
uh, especially people who do uh, comedy, not just not just animation that's that's uh, humorous, but uh, the the timeline on whether your stuff is still funny is weird. It's extremely strange and it's dangerous. Um, the jokes that work right now may be the thing that gets you kicked off two years from now. And that's weird because the content itself hasn't changed, but how we respond to it does. Yeah, it's completely unfair to to expect that of anybody. You're going to ask anybody to predict what's going to be frowned upon in, in two or three or five years. Uh, and we're not even talking about censor yourself in big ways uh, where it's like, obviously, don't make that kind of joke. It's stuff that's not obvious. The content, co- There's nothing in Content Cup in that video that you're talking about that is obviously a fa- like where somebody could point it out and say, that makes total sense why that got removed. There's nothing in that inherently that everybody can see. Can, can unanimously point to as being a problem. It's sort of whatever YouTube feels like might be a problem hypothetically to either other creators or advertisers in five years. Nobody on the planet can predict that. I don't know if an AI could predict that. It's, it's, it's completely at the whim of whatever the culture and everything else surrounding that is at that time. Who's the CEO? Is YouTube, does YouTube have a competitor at that point? Is it, is its power, you know, waiting? There's a billion factors you cannot predict that are going to influence that. Yeah, I figured it was the chin jokes. I'm guessing that yeah, they figured it was that, le- that it's like making fun yeah, of his saying appearance. Leafy had a weak weak chin. That that came into effect with those those rules on bullying and harassment, where you can't make fun of physical experience or an inherent characteristic like age or ethnicity or something that you know somebody can't change. It's it's not their fault one way or the other. Um, but yeah, it was that that element, and it, it, to think that anybody uh, anybody at all, uh, not just specifically iDubs, but in 2016 would sit down and look at the script of what they want to do in a video and think, well, this is okay now. Some people might think that saying you know, talking about Leafy's chin is mean, but it's ultimately not something that's going to get the video, you know, killed. Um, but but maybe in four or five years that will cross a line. There's no way that anybody yeah, could exactly. do that effectively. It's just not possible. And if you live in fear of it and err on the side of caution, it's got to be chilling, right? Like there, there must be jokes for things that you haven't made because of the kind of chilling effect, right? I mean, there's got to be. Yeah, sure. I think anybody has that. And I would say on top of that, Dad, what you're saying too – I, I think I think the biggest effect it's going to have is is you have content creators that are going to start living in fear, and that's going to affect their content, and they're going to become less interesting, less funny, less engaging. You're and, and then the audience will notice that it's a lose 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 lose. You're doing nobody any good. And I I, I am not, look I'm I'm a big free speech guy, but I'm also that's so, you know if if it's it's YouTube is a private platform, they can do whatever they want. I I understand that, but I'm just saying. From zoom out from that. Forget forget the free speech versus both. Forget all of that. I'm just saying, from a good versus bad content perspective, you are going to get inferior and worse content. I feel like if your creators are constantly unsure what the rules of a year from now are going to be, it's not even if YouTube from day one had come out and said no making fun of people's physical appearances. That's totally different. That makes complete sense. Everybody knew from the get go. But the real problem is, all right, they could they could make. Uh, you know, making fun of a politician is now bad. Like that's that's as crazy as what they've yeah. done now. I think where it's it's there's not even like a rhyme or a reason or a pattern to it. It's just kind of I I get I get why they did it, but I don't see a pattern to it, and I have no idea what kind of change like that they're gonna do they're gonna do next. But again, I think the worst result of that is gonna be I think content will suffer. I think the creators will be a little bit afraid of either their video getting demonetized now or getting demonetized in five years. And I, I think I think it just makes for a worse YouTube for both the audience and the creators. Nobody wins in that situation. What, what has it been like for you working with standards and practices? Because you have to go through them for TV. I mean, we had a bunch of fun stuff. We had we, we got a bunch of notes on violence, and we were like, "What? There's a bunch of other stuff on on this network on Adult Swim that is way more violent." And we pushed back, and they were pretty good about it, actually. I think the only thing we they we 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 push for and they were like no we're not going to do that is uh the boss breastfeeding being censored. They we I was like I was like it's not going to be funny if it's censored. I think it ended up being fine. They originally wanted to do a black bar. 
like a black square. And I was like, that's not going to be funny. You can't even see what's happening. And so we said, we were like, can we just make it so that maybe like the baby's mouth covers up the nipple? We just erased it. They said no. So they really pushed for the, the pixelation thing. Or they pushed for the black bar. And we said, can we do the pixelation? And they were finally like, yeah, you can do that. But they they were pretty good for most things. It was mostly that, and it was um, there was a seizure fucking thing at the end where when it's the commercial on TV when the blibly like comes up on screen and it's like he's dancing really quickly. The thing was dancing so fast. Uh, I didn't know that they did this, but they put everything through uh like an AI that tells if it would induce a seizure, and that like kept flagging it because the thing was dancing so fast. So he had to go into the animation file. And like, like, slow the frames down, and we also we also had red text above it, Jeez. or no, we had uh, yeah, we had red text that said "blibly control," flashing re- like really quickly. We had exclamation points also. So if you look at that, it's kind of it's kind of framed weirdly because it's a big yellow background with one guy kind of in the middle. Originally, there was like stuff above him and next to him that we had to cut out, but but minus that, I mean, it was pr- they were pretty. Um, they were pretty good about it, I think. I don't think they asked for too much to be cut out. I would say, I would say standards of practices is actually less harsh than, than YouTube nowadays. I really believe that. That's what I was wondering. That that's kind of what I was going was going for because I think that there has been a lot of criticism of people saying like, "Hey, you know, this type of joke they say on like late night. Yeah, why can't I say it on YouTube? Like, you're kidding me. Like NBC can say this, but YouTube can't." Yeah, South Park gets away with, with actual bullying by those definitions. They bully people's physical appearances all the time. They made Rob Reiner a big fat guy who's eating cheeseburgers. Like, my, po- my point is... They they, but- they made Sally Struthers job of the Yeah, heart. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, uh, I mean, the whole thing with Tom Cruise being in the closet, they, they did a bunch of stuff that, that by YouTube's own standards would, would be not only demonetizable, but, like, removable. They would remove a lot of South Park episodes by those standards. I So... If you can't even get away with you, what you can get away with on TV, on cable TV, I just feel like that's not a very constructive, good environment for content creators to be living in. And it's amazing well, to, to me Well, to show that, you how bad um, the judgment is, standards and practices wasn't even very good uh, at eliminating a seizure risk because the breastfeeding scene <laughs> that was kept in very nearly gave me a seizure. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're not the only person to say that. Two people said their eyes rolled back and they, their ears didn't ring and shit. So, you know, we, what, we, we snuck one through just despite the standards of practice as people. <laughs> also, I had a bunch of coffee. Um, I'm going to urinate really quickly. Give me two seconds here. Oh, I took a shit. Yeah. I ended up taking a shit. You ever do that? You go to you go to take a pee and you're like, you know what? I can feel. It's because of all the black coffee I had to wake myself up before this. We want to get into uh, questions from our baby gang members and our, our infantry. <laughs> uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to make a note because it popped into my head that they were complaining about violence. Meanwhile, Super Jail was okay. Like that was no, the dude, most I know. show ever. That show was based upon gratuitous violence which by the way i love that but i we, we told it, we went to, it was great we told them we were like dude mr pickles rick and morty uh super jail all those shows have wait south park is more violent like we had nothing in the pilot that was violent except for the little blibblies dying but even that like they're little they're little stupid like spam characters they're, they're not like it's like we're killing or decapitating humans in the show it, we're decapitating these little these little fucking amoebas they're not even people they're nothing you know <laughs> But 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 we we ended yeah, up Mr. we ended Pickles up just has a lot of gruesome stuff. They they, they gave us they said cut the blood down and we just gave it to them normally and they just they never said anything about it. So 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 James from the Baby Gang wants to know what it's like uh, working with Michael Cusack. Uh, the guy is very mentally unwell. He's got a lot of problems. He's he's impulsive. He's he's got no ability to kind of you uh, can't look at how he's acting. He doesn't you know he's not self aware in that way. He'll just sometimes spit or like break stuff. He'll kind of do whatever he feels like doing in the moment. He lashes out. Does that make sense when I say he lashes out? Um, he'll get irate. He has mood swings, big mood swings. He'll go from crying to screaming. I mean, just, just, no, he's, I'm only doing a bit. The worst. D- don't, don't sue me, Michael Cusack. Don't sue me for the other half of the show. Uh, he's great. We, we, I feel like Michael and I uh, are different enough that it's interesting, but we're similar enough where it, it works. You know what I mean? Like where. If you look at Michael's work and you look at my work, they seem on the outside really, really uh, 
what's the what what what's the word that means not similar? It's, is it, what, what's what's the thing that goes in front of? It? Is it dissimilar? It's not un, mm-hmm. it's dissimilar, not unsimilar. Yeah. yeah, it's dissimilar. Anyways, our our work um is very dissimilar. It's not like it's not you 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 can't really see too many things that that are have overlap. But when when we work together, I think it works. I think um it's it's been I've seen a lot of people when they tweet at me over smiling friends and say like. Oh, I can totally tell you did this. The truth of the matter is, we both did like everything together, and I, I mean that. I'm not just saying that. Like we, every character creation, every line of dialogue, all the backgrounds, everything. We we it was a conversation. So, and I think as the show goes on, uh, I think it'll become a little more apparent what the style. Again, if we get to make more, what the style of the show is versus my solo stuff and Michael's solo stuff. Now, sometimes we do have stuff that comes out in the show. That is a little bit more me, a little bit more Michael. Like a good example is a lot of the characters at the party scene were just drawn by Michael, and a lot, like the boss is just drawn by me, basically. But even then, it was Michael and I having input of, oh, give this person this thing or you know do this. So even when it looks surface level, like it's a big creative push on Michael or my end, it, the truth is it's 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 really both of us. But it's great. I I, I like it a lot. I think it's um. It's it's gratifying. I think uh, we're able to sit down and kind of back and forth pretty quickly. Who's whose joke? Sorry, this just popped into my head. It was so funny. <laughs> whose joke was it with the the fingerboarding? Where the guy's like gonna gonna he's ch- trying to trying to <laughs> trying to sell him off as this like uh, awesome skateboarder. I, his cousin. I really don't remember. I think I think it was. I had it. I had a tech deck, and that's I think that's what got us started. He may have pitched the joke. I don't remember. The set. I, I I remember where we were when we wrote the pilot. We uh, are are. Um, I hate saying the fucking. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna nullify it later by in a second by by clarifying how stupid it is. But we we share um, uh, an agent and but he was at it. He's not like a Hollywood agent. He's literally like some late twenties like jock, like the guy. I I really like the guy. So if he ever hears, I don't think he will. But if he ever hears this, it's not a negative thing. But he's just a, he's like literally six foot five. He's got like a Ronald Reagan hairline. He's but he like he's one of these fucking guys that he uh he's like a guy where he just eats chicken wings and buffalo wings and pizza, but he's still ripped. He's not at all. But he's he talk. He, <laughs> he's Chad. Yeah, he's, he's a Chad. He's a fucking Chad, dude. <laughs> he's a Chad. When we when we he, when he invited us over to his house. He lives like by the beach. And kind of, he invited us over to his house. He's like, hey, come over to our house. We're like, all right. And we went over, and he was in his boxers and a t-shirt. And we were like, he opened the door, and he was like, this was for 4th of July, like, two years ago. And we were like, what happened? Like, where is everybody? I thought there was a party. And he was like, he kept he kept saying, yeah, the cops co- co- came, and they yeah, they rolled us. And the cops came, and they just rolled us. He kept saying the word. I was like, what the fuck does that mean? But I, but I So that's the kind of guy he is. But anyways, he's got, like, a bead bag and, like, an Xbox and, like, pizza. And his, but he he, and his, he had, like, lived with, he lived with three roommates, and they all left out of town because it was the holidays. And Michael and I just sat in this guy's fucking empty, like, like house that he shared with three guys, and we paced around his pool, and we wrote the whole pilot. So I, the whole writing of that, like, we had it skeletoned out, but that whole section of, like, the party scene and the Dave Land shit, it's all a haze. I really don't remember. And I, But I remember on Christmas Day was when we were writing it. We were sleeping at that thing. We woke up and we walked to some shitty gas station. And on Christmas Day, we, like, got a gas station burrito – and then we just went back to writing. So that's that's how I remember that. So, but the honest truth is, I don't remember who fucking wrote that joke. That whole <laughs> like four days is like a weird haze of of just eating shitty gas station food and uh, sleeping in some guy's Airbnb. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so weird haze brings the next question, which is from uh, Chinchilla. Now bear with me on this question. I'll bear okay? because he asked. What, uh, why do you animate my fever dreams and how do you know about them? So it sounds kind of goofy, but you know, but that's, that's really what happens. I mean, you're talking about uh, hazes and he's talking about fever dreams, but that's what makes so many of these things epically funny and interesting because it is like you're peering into the bizarre depths of everybody's mind. How do you do this? Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, but uh, the 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 biggest role the biggest thing that we try to do is if it's not making us laugh we don't really want to do it like you can write something down that's like funny on paper and there's nothing wrong with that but we try to make it so every joke 
hopefully we laugh at or we find something really funny about. Uh, and that goes for like the, the weird, creepy stuff too. Um, you know, I, I think, I think horror and comedy are really, really close. Like discomfort, basically, I think could be, Kirby Enthusiasm is a whole show built on that. And it's kind of like cringe. I think cringe and discomfort is so close to comedy that you could do almost like horror comedy. If you can, the office, too, the, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, same version. thing. That whole yeah. thing is just about same exact thing, and exactly. Yeah. And so, in the same way that you can look at something and go, "Oh, you know, that that makes me laugh. That's funny." You can look at something and go, "That makes me uncomfortable." So, if we can ever make ourselves uncomfortable with like the weird stuff, like with the boss or whatever, or even some people have even said they've been disturbed by the rotoscope guy, which I don't fully see. I, I mean, that scene's supposed to be kind of a nightmare of him blowing the vape and the fisheye lens and everything. Like that's supposed. It's it is the <laughs> the way that he moves is unnerving, and he's so hideous. He's ugly. Like, he's, he's a really fucking nasty character. Especially ugly in a weird way, like not in the way that a lot of the characters that you draw are kind of grotesque looking. <laughs> he's he's ugly in a way that's like unnerving, and <laughs> I I kind of agree with that. I think it's he's an unsettling. No, I character. agree, and we also put a weird droning noise, and it's a fisheye lens view when he's yelling at him. You know, we want it to feel like you're really getting chastised at a party, which is what happened is yeah. your adrenaline would start rushing, and your fucking ears would start ringing, and it would be it would be tunnel vision experience. But no, I agree. That guy, that character is disgusting. And he deserves no love. He deserves to never find a wife. Uh, and I don't think yeah, to will. hide Easter eggs with, he'll never be able to do that. You saying the thing about discomfort in comedy being so close made me think of a, a friend I had years ago talked about the talent show feeling, which was a knot in his stomach when he would see an act at like a community talent show that was really oh. horrible, and he would feel embarrassment uh, for them and just it was a really negative awful feeling at the time but years later he would go back in, in his mind and think about that bad act and it was really really funny to him that that blurred line between hating it in the moment and then laughing at it until the end of time uh, that kind of reinforces your point on that absolutely and i think i think even a horror in general is just the act of surprise that's all comedy really is, you know. It's just it's the assembly of new information in a way that you were not expecting. Like everything really has been done in the way of, you know, you're not you're expecting to see a person in an animated or a live action show or something. You're expecting to see that it's going to be on Earth, and you can have weird, you know, uh, like creative bends towards these premises. I'm just saying, like when you watch, you know, The Office or Always Sunny or curb your enthusiasm or whatever uh whatever you're watching there's a familiarity to it but the joke is always some some kind of you're not expecting that exact way of it happening and that's all horror is it's just surprising you it's your body like the way i put it is you ever look at something in your room and you don't really it's like kind of dark and you're like what is that you're looking at a coat rack and you're like is that a, is that a person that kind of moment of your brain giving extra attention to to something is all comedy really is, I think, and all horror really is. It's just the swallowing of the reaction of new information. So in the same way that if you – like if you were doing a comedy movie and you have a character that's alone and you pan to the left and then there's a guy just standing there that wasn't there. You play a horror thing and he goes, hey, man, what's up? That's a joke. That's scary, but that's also funny. Like that, it, 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 that, that works on both levels where it did scare you, but that's what's funny about it. And it's also surprising and it's played so deadpan. So – uh yeah, I think I think it all just boils down to also another thing that we tried to put into every scene was like, what do we want the audience to be feeling? Like most of the time, that's what well, yeah, we want them to laugh. But sometimes, like the boss scene specifically, it was like we want them to be uncomfortable. We want to make them like want to feel like they're crawling out of their skin. So we try to reverse engineer that as much as possible by going, what what what's the point of this scene? Like, what should the audience be feeling as they're watching it and after the scene is over? Uh, and if you can do that, if you can kind of walk into something with that mindset, it allows you to really kind of go, okay, well, for example, like if the, if the, if that scene with the boss, if all the colors were really re normal looking, if they were kind of regular color palette, and we said, we're trying to make people uncomfortable, okay, well, the colors are normal, let's tweak them and make them darker and weirder. So it, it gives you kind of an anchor point of, a reference point of what you're trying to do and, and what, where it's lacking, if that makes sense. 
And when you're when you're writing the script, do you think about okay, this scene just ended on this like high energy funny moment, so the next one let's like tone it down and make it weird, just so there's some sort of like heartbeat of the show? Or, or what are your thoughts on? The yeah, flow definitely. The, of, I I, I would say, I would say, I, I'm not the one the first one to say this, but you know, you write a you write something kind of three times. You write it in the script, and you write it in the audio mix, and you write it. A final time, you know, say when, when you're editing, but I, you know, the final time really is when you're doing the kind of animatic, and I guess you do edit it one more time. But there was a, like, if you look at the script from the pilot compared to the final thing, we ended up cutting and changing so much. A lot of the times, you'll find jokes when you're doing the audio, like you're you're putting, you're taking all the audio tracks. To, I'll give you a really good example of that actually. Um, when we recorded uh, Finn Wolfhard's lines for the the guy in the wall that argues with uh, the red guy, Alan. That yeah that that like uh, yeah 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 that line was not in there originally. That was him. That's just Finn talking to us. That's him actually like reacting in the booth of us going do it this way. And he's laughing going okay yeah 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 okay yeah yeah. But we took that out. We're like that'd be well, let's just use that. So you find a lot of things that way where it's like I think the original line there was him quoting. Uh, did you guys ever see that video where Jesse Ventura went on like Opie Anthony or whatever and he gets in, the, in that argument with Jim Norton. It's a really weird video, and and then <laughs> yeah. and then when he stands yeah. up, Jesse Ventura goes, "Bye bye, tough guy." <laughs> bye bye, tough guy. So originally, originally in the script, I think I think it was Finn going, "You bye bye, tough guy." Bye bye, tough guy. And I think he he did he, he did those lines, but we were like, "God, it'd be funnier if you went, yeah 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 okay yeah," because you know, people do that in arguments. So that's an example where, like, the way that scene ended, kind of, and and that joke specifically, kind of came out in the audio more than it even came out in the script. So it's just an accident. I mean, you just found yeah. him <laughs> reacting you re- reacting to you naturally as part of the recording Absolutely. process and turned to that into a joke later. That's amazing. And and a final example would be this didn't come out in the audio, but this came out a step. This is the last example, but uh, in in sort of the animation of that that ending part where uh, like when the whole pilot's kind of resolving itself um, and. Charlie, the guy that I voiced, and the red guy are kind of going, oh, I guess he just learned the lesson. They start laughing. The thing where the red guy sucks on his nose, that was something I I put in very, very, very last minute. It was like I was animating <laughs> that specific scene, and uh, he does that weird knob noise, and I was like, why don't I just have him do that? So that was something that was not in the script at all, and it wasn't even in the audio. That was something that just came down to uh, sort of like improvising while we were drawing, and that happened a lot. Um so every every time you go through it, you really get a chance to put something on top of it. And usually you can tell, like, oh, this scene needs a little bit more. It's not working that great. You need something more visual here. Or another good example is uh, one of the last minute changes we made was uh, when they go to the mom's house. Uh, or they go to Desmond's house at the beginning. They talk to the mom. And she knocks at the door and says, Desmond. Originally, that was just her going, Desmond. And then we were like, it'd be funnier if she yelled it. So we re-recorded it and had her scream it. <laughs> but that was like a very, very, very last minute change. That was like right before the mix. Why does she walk so weird? Her feet <laughs> so fast, like pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. <laughs> like she walks. The so trick straight. to animation to make it funny if you're a hack like I am, and like I'm not gonna say Michael. Michael's a funny guy, but if you're a, if if you want to make shit uh, and you don't know how to do it, just make make it move fast. <laughs> fast is the is the key to to animation if you want to make okay. it funny. Just make it move really quick, and it's always going to be funny. That's it. Well, it is funny oh. the juxtaposition between this decrepit, <laughs> decaying, like living corpse of a woman <laughs> having this like incredibly fast feet. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, th- I think I think she. That's could, the <laughs> kind of little thing that makes me. She laugh. could run pretty fast. I think I'd be afraid of it. No. <laughs> and, yeah, Armando really is just whatever is funny. When let's just try to do that with the animation. the The last one we got is uh, is from Boromir, and I, I love this question because I think there is a documentary about this. His question is, "What is the funniest shit you've ever seen?" And I think there is a documentary about comedians talking about the the single joke that they found funniest. Um, I want to say it was like 15 years ago, uh, when that, when that came out and it was really fascinating to hear what funny people thought was funny. So what is the funniest shit you've ever seen? Oh my God. That's a really good question. Uh, but it's what I'm going to have to think about for a second. I think 
Now, is this, is this like the hardest I've ever laughed at anything, or is this just sort of like, what do I really find funny when I need a laugh? Because I don't, I... I think you can go your own direction on that. Oh boy, that's a good, that's a really good question. I, I would want to know the funniest, or the thing that you've laughed the absolute hardest that, at. I that's what I'm racking my if brain you know for. What uh, which frustrated because I feel like I saw something recently or I remembered something recently or re-saw something recently where I was like, no, that still is really funny. To me, the stuff that makes me always laugh is, 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 is the real stuff. I, I really do enjoy, I think my favorite non kind of weird cringe thing, like Norm Macdonald consistently, I can go, I can go watch his stuff, his podcast stuff, his stand up stuff. And I can always laugh at that, uh, just super consistently. I, I still think Norm Macdonald is, is, in my opinion, my favorite living comedian, I think. Just insanely funny and does it all flawlessly too. Uh, I think um, I think in terms of stuff I laugh the hardest at, it's got to be like weird real videos. There's actually like a section or, or, or a subsection of video that I don't think even has a name. And I was realizing this, but I guess you'd call it like walk-in cringe, like people getting walked in on. But people are like walking into somebody else's room or whatever and then arguing with them. Like have you ever seen that video of the dude dressed up as the Joker and his roommate walks in? It's like 10 years old. And the roommate walks in and he's like, uh, hey, man, what you doing, man? You like the Joker? And the guy's, the guy's like dressed – it's like a college dorm. And the dude's dressed up as the Joker, like doing the Joker lap before his roommate walks in. And it's fucking such a brutal video, but there is something so unbelievably funny about being trapped there with a camera on you, and someone is just, like, bothering you, and then you decide to upload that. Another video <laughs> like that, too, is, like, when Chris Chan's dad walks in, you know, that video, oh, yeah, do, uh, do you realize, do you uh, realize something? If Bob. the health department yeah, of Green County sees those videos, they could condemn our house and we'd have to move out of it? I'm yep. working on it. That video is so fucking weird. Can somebody? I'm I working work. on. Can I plead to the audience? Can somebody please make a, a subreddit called like "Walk In Cringe"? Because there's a genre for that, and nobody's put a label on that. It's such a good genre. It's fucking. It's put. Also, the video of like the mom walking into the to the two little girls, and she's like, "Which one of you took a shit?" There's a whole. Oh yeah, I'm telling you, man. It, disgusting. That's a whole fucking <laughs> like subgenre nobody talks about. It's such a good subgenre. That's the only one I thought of was the model. Yeah, I, mean, on the two I bet people Disgusting. would be surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh. um, I also want to not let it pass that that question was clearly a reference to the pickle. Rick I, I was going to say I had a, I had a feeling I had I had a yeah, feeling in my tummy yeah. that that was a pickle Rick reference. Yeah. <laughs> but oh we go goodness. beyond that here. We ascend to higher planes. Why 11 you may ask yeah, because we a- always go one beyond. <laughs> in, in the words of Doug Walker, the great statesman, the great diplomat. Straight straight to the spinal now, tap reference. Now we need the t-shirt of Pim as Sonic. Yeah. I I hey man, oh, I've God. I've been telling the network. I've been saying, hey, when can we get that Pim X Sonic uh, fan art? Dude, yeah. I, fuck. <laughs> I just realized I would love to see Chris Chan draw Pim. I would pay a thousand dollars for that. <laughs> what does that character look like through his eyes, through his little Beautiful world through his through his beautiful mind. I don't know. Maybe he could make a medallion <laughs> for you. You could wear it. I yes. would love that. Are you kidding me? That'd be amazing. <laughs> well, look, man. Thank you so much for hanging out with us for for so long. We loved having you back. You're welcome. Literally anytime you want. We'll we'll have you on the show every single week if you want. That sounds good to me. Well, thank you guys for having me on uh, in the first place. It's been a, a blast yet again. Dare I say, uh, it's been a wonderful, been a wonderful <laughs> time. I think James Cameron directed this episode. I think he did. It's a, this is yeah. The extended See, that was edition, good because yeah. if we do a third one, now it's gonna suck. But you know what? Let's 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 be. What's the best <laughs> movie? That's the, the, what, is there is there a trilogy or a movie franchise where the third one's actually the best one? Um, I think that Lord of the Rings, the third one, is the only one that won yeah. the Academy. Yeah. All right, Awards. instead instead of Terminator, so Return of the King was pretty good. Let's do a let's yeah. pull a fucking Lord of the Rings next time and really uh, put it over the top. We'll win an Oscar, and in the meantime, <laughs> is there anything that our audience can do? Can we get a campaign going? Can we like knock on? 
uh, whomever's door to make sure that we get more smiling friends episodes. You just if people keep spreading the love, keep uh, liking, retweeting everything anyone's doing. That's all you need. That's all I need. And as long as the network sees the love for it, I think that's gonna that's gonna keep the little flame alive. And uh, yeah, I think I think it's it's looking good. It's looking as good as anything can look in a situation like this. So just keep keep up what everyone's doing. All right. Well, we'll keep up supporting you. You keep up entertaining us. We love your stuff. And uh, hopefully we uh, can have you back here soon. I think that'll be the case. All right. Thanks, Thank Zach. Thank you. And keep being adorable, you two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you, Space Cowboys. Bye-bye, Bye, tough guys. guy. <laughs> our, 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 <laughs> you mean our next, our next president of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank everybody who we talk to every day in the Discord, and especially the patrons who make this show happen. Thanks to our editor, Marcus Allen, and to associate producers Jeff Davis, Isaac Teal, Trev's Dead, James Gallagher, Baseweight, Andrew Stimson, Keaton Sample, Jesse Robertson, Boromir, Monsieur Chinchilla, Sean Malone, Jen Mafasanti, Kevin with an E, Menard, Monahim, Yogurt 96, Fraken, and our newest addition, Mikhail. Thank you for signing up, Mikhail. We love it. Also, thanks to baby wrangling super producer Ben Webster. Thanks as well to Paula Lieber and the stunningly gorgeous Mo Lewitt, and to our very generous sponsor of every episode, Eagle Brand Sardines. The Create Unknown is a production of Unknown Media. Okay, bye.